Okay, hello and welcome to another tutorial video. This time we're going back to software as a service and subscription business models and venture capital and growth equity modeling. And we're going to discuss the so-called rule of 40. So we've covered a lot of SaaS metrics previously. I've linked to some of the videos here and I'll, and I'll put them down below the video in the first pinned comment as well. But I wanna focus on a slightly newer human created metric this time, which is the rule of 40. As far as I can tell, it came about starting in a 2015 blog post from Brad Feld. I've pulled up the post right here. And right after he published it, this idea seemed to take over the entire SaaS world. Things spread very quickly online. Now, some people disagree about how to calculate it, what it means and how to use it. So we're going to get into those nuances here. Also, some venture capital firms have created improved versions since 2015, such as the rule of X. So we'll also examine those. For all the files and resources here, you'll want to go to our rule of 40 page within our venture capital area. Again, I'll link this URL below the video in the first pinned comment so you can get all the files and resources there. This is another excerpt from our VC and growth equity modeling course, which covers the rule of 40 in the context of case studies involving SaaS companies. So in a nutshell, the rule of 40 states that for a software as a service company, its revenue growth plus EBITDA margin should equal or exceed 40%. The basic idea here is pretty simple, which is that there's always a trade-off between growth and profitability. So if a company wants to grow more quickly, it's going to have to give up some short-term profits because it's going to have to spend more on sales and marketing to grow. But then if a company wants to become more profitable, it can do so, but it's going to have to give up some of that growth because it won't spend as much on sales and marketing and outreach efforts. And so its profits will go up, but it will not be reaching as many new customers anymore. The meaning or supposed meaning here is that Companies with higher revenue growth plus EBITDA margins should be valued more highly in theory, at least if you look at their valuation in terms of revenue multiples. There are lots of questions about how to calculate this because for the profit proportion, the EBITDA margin, some people argue that you should use free cash flow or unlevered free cash flow or variations instead. Some people also say that instead of just standard revenue growth, you should use something like annualized recurring revenue growth or monthly recurring revenue growth or other variations like that. The fundamental problem here is that for many sets of comparable SaaS public companies, the rule of 40 doesn't necessarily produce much higher correlation with revenue multiples than simple revenue growth. So our opinion is that this one is more of an operational metric you can use to assess budgets and forecasts and projections and benchmark companies rather than a true valuation metric. Just to show you a quick example of this, if we pull up some of our graphs here, there are some sets where the correlation is fairly high, 0 0.72, 0 0.63, something in that range. But if you look at other sets, it drops to much lower levels, like 0 0.08, for example, or even for this set of larger cloud companies, it's only around 0.4 if you look at R squared. So you can definitely find sets where it's just not that strongly correlated with revenue multiples. If you look at something like return on equity, and the price to book value multiple for banks, which we've covered before in this channel, pretty recently in fact, these are very highly correlated. The rule of 40 and revenue multiples are not even within the same ballpark as return on equity and the price to book value multiple. So that's the rule of 40 in a nutshell. Let's go into it in more detail now. And if you wanna keep watching and see some of the calculations and variations and disagreements, we will go through all that now. I'll start with how to calculate the rule of 40 using salesforce.com. Then we will look at the valuation implications and go through some of those regressions I just showed you briefly. Then we will look at the rule of 40 as an operational metric and how it might be useful there. And then we'll go into the rule of X and some other variations and improvements on this. So at a basic level, it's not too difficult to calculate the rule of 40 if you know how to get the company's revenue growth and EBITDA from its filings. Let's pull up an example for Salesforce. And I've taken their 10K right here and I'm just using their 2024 to 2023 numbers. So we could take the total revenues, it's about 34, 35 billion, and then about 31.3 billion or 31.4 billion in the previous period. Just take this, divide by the previous one and subtract one. For EBITDA, we can take their operating income. I would not add back restructuring here because it does not appear to be one time. It seems to be recurring, at least it is if you go back several years. And then we go to the cash flow statement, scrolling down a little bit to get their depreciation and amortization, and that gets us their EBITDA numbers. And so we can use all that to make a very simple calculation for the rule of 40 here. Revenue growth is about 11%, EBITDA is about 9 billion, and so the EBITDA margin here is about 25 or 26%. We have 11% growth, so 37% is the rule of 40 metric for salesforce.com. 
Now, some people, as I was saying, disagree about elements of this, specifically about the proper revenue and profits to use. We're not going to go into the profit side too much here, but I do want to discuss revenue and show you one quick variation of this. Some people argue that you shouldn't really look at total revenue. You should look at subscription revenue or annualized recurring revenue or monthly recurring revenue instead. And we can certainly do that for Salesforce. In fact, I'm going to pull up the Excel file right here and show you what we can do. So I have their subscription revenue and then their professional services revenue laid out right here. We can say that the professional services revenue is non-recurring, so only the script subscription revenue is recurring. And then we can annualize it by taking the quarterly recurring revenue and multiplying by four the number of quarters in the year. And then we can take this and just copy it all the way across. Now we have the revenue growth rates here already, the year over year ones, but we can look at the annualized recurring revenue growth rates as well. So we'll take the ARR right here and divide by the ARR in the same quarter from the previous fiscal year. And I'll subtract one, and then I'll copy this across. And I'll just close that grouping. And then let's see what we get to with the rule of 40 calculating like this. I'm gonna keep the EBITDA margin the same. I don't think there's really a reason to change that for right now. Let's take the ARR growth rate year over year and add the EBITDA margin and then copy this over. And you can see that we get to virtually the same results here. They're a little bit different by 1%, 2%, something like that, but functionally they're the same. I've also plotted the company's average revenue multiple in each quarter below this. And you can see that unsurprisingly, the rule of 40 was about the same for this company over this time frame, And so they were always in this range of about five to six to seven X revenue. So that's one variation. With EBITDA, you could use free cash flow instead or unlevered free cash flow or something like that. But in this case, it's actually quite close to Salesforce's EBITDA. So I don't think there's any point in doing it here. If you were dealing with a company where EBITDA and free cash flow were more different, this method would make more sense. Also, this whole method with annualized recurring revenue instead would make more sense if you were dealing with something like a high growth startup whose numbers were changing a lot and where the company was growing a lot from quarter to quarter. But in this case, it just doesn't matter for a company this mature. Let's talk about valuation implications. A lot of people claim that the rule of 40 correlates with companies' revenue multiples. So to assess this, we're looking at a couple different comparable sets here. One with these companies between 100 million and a billion in revenue and revenue growth and EBITDA margins above 10%. Another with smaller companies, 100 to 500 million in revenue, but potentially higher revenue growth because we constrain it to between 10% and 30%. And then this last one for large cloud companies. This is based on the Bessemer Cloud Index and it includes companies with over a billion in revenue. So the first set, the correlation is actually pretty high here. R squared is about 0.72 and the revenue growth correlation is about 0.63 or 0.64. So the rule of 40 is definitely better, but the correlation is decently strong for both of them, at least for a very messy data set like this. Now, if you go to the next set here, the small high growth SaaS companies, there is almost no correlation. R squared is 0.08 for the rule of 40. And then for revenue growth, it's 0.18. So revenue growth is actually stronger in this case, but in both cases, looking at this graph, I would say there's almost no correlation between the growth rates, the margins, and the overall revenue multiples. And then this last set, these large cloud companies. So this one's sort of in the middle. R squared is 0.4 for the rule of 40, and it's about 0.36 or 0.37 if you look at just revenue growth. The bottom line is that there is some relationship here, but it depends very heavily on the specific set of SaaS companies that you're looking at and just how important growth is versus profit margins and profitability for those companies as well as on their size. Let's go to the next part now and talk about the rule of 40 as an operational metric. So as you just saw, depending on the companies you pick, it's not always strongly correlated with valuation multiples, but it can be useful to assess a company's forecasts and budgets and benchmark it. So for example, if peer companies in your set have revenue growth plus EBITDA margins of around 30%, but your company claims to have 60%, or claims to have had 60% consistently, you know that something is probably wrong there, assuming that these companies are all about the same size. You wanna see consistency, you wanna see a company generally in a similar range to its peers, and you do generally wanna see numbers decline over time as the company matures. So I have up here an example from one of our SaaS case studies with the rule of 40 calculated. And here it starts off at around 50%, it falls to 8%, then goes up to 21%. 
Then the company raises significant outside funding. It falls to 11% as it spends a lot on sales and marketing. And then it rises back to around 35 to 40% over time, which makes sense because it just spent a lot of money on upfront sales and marketing to win more customers. And then it realizes the benefits over this period, but it never goes up to 50 or 60 or 70%. It sort of always stays in that 35 to 40% range. Let's now talk about the rule of X and some other variations on the rule of 40. Bessemer, one of the VC firms that popularized the rule of 40, also proposed the rule of X, which states that you take the revenue growth and then you multiply it by some type of multiplier or factor, and then you add the EBITDA or free cash flow margin. Now, this multiplier might be between 1.5x and 3x, depending on the company's stage and maturity. And the basic point here is that in most cases, higher revenue growth is more valuable and affects the multiples more than higher profit margins. And if you look at their website where they describe this, they have a lot of data backing this up and you can go through all the graphs. Again, I'll link to this in the page and also below this video, but essentially what it comes down to, if you read through all this, is that yes, there is more of a relationship if you graph this rule of X against company's valuation multiples than if you just graph the rule of 40 or the simple revenue growth. So I do think it is an improvement. It might be worth using, but when all is said and done, all these metrics and rules are just simple heuristics and they're not real valuation. Ultimately, if you really wanna see what a company is worth, you have to build a long-term DCF that is based on some detail around the company's unit economics. That's about it for this tutorial. Let's do a quick recap and summary now. How to calculate the rule of 40. Take revenue growth and add the EBITDA margin. If you want, you can use ARR or MRR growth instead of just simple revenue, or you can just limit it to subscription revenue growth. You could also use the free cash flow margin or variations rather than the EBITDA margin as long as you're consistent. Valuation implications. There is sometimes decent correlation here between the rule of 40 and revenue multiples, but usually, the revenue growth is also pretty highly correlated, if not more so, sometimes a little bit less, sometimes a little bit more, but usually in about the same range. That said, the correlation here is never super strong. It's never 0.9 or 0.95 for R squared or anything like that. At most, you're looking at numbers of maybe 0.6 to 0.7 in terms of R squared. The rule of 40, in our view, is more useful as an operational metric. You can use it to see if the company's forecast makes sense or if they're completely making up numbers. You can also see how a company compares to its industry and peers. The rule of X, which weights revenue growth more heavily, is certainly an improvement. But at the end of the day, if you really want to value a company, build a detailed DCF analysis. Don't rely on just these simple, quick metrics. That's about it for this tutorial. Hopefully now you know a little bit more about the rule of 40 and how to think about analyze and value software as a service companies.